I'm assuming that all of you, or at least some of you, have treated heartworm in your shelters, correct? Um, so my talk today is going to be about um, the shelter uh, heartworm treatment that we do, and it might be different than what you guys do. Um, and I want to kind of preface um, my talk by saying that because we are in a university and we have sort of other issues that we have to deal with um, when it comes to treating dogs with heartworm. So um, I'll get started. So you guys all know this, that, that heartworm disease is a big, big problem in shelter dogs and cats. Um, we are not going to be talking about cats today. I'm going to leave that to people that um, have better expertise with treating heartworm in cats because I certainly don't. Um, but as you all know, especially if you're from Florida or from the south, there are a lot of rural shelters um, in, in our area that don't have the resources to treat dogs with heartworm. And some of them don't even have the resources to, tr to even test these animals. So because of that, we have many, many animals that are euthanized every year in animal shelters just because of their heartworm positive status. And um, to, to sort of complicate all of that, we have these new findings about resistance. And I'm sure all of you have heard about that. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in my talk as well. And um, this is mainly seen in heartworms in the Mississippi Delta area of the country. But the fear is that that is then going to spread to other areas of the country, particularly in the Deep South. Um, and again, most heartworm experts think that that is due to the use of slow kill um, therapies in shelter dogs and I know a lot of shelter veterinarians use the slow kill method. I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end as well because I think that there's two different methods of slow kill. Um, one is a little bit more um, likely to have better outcome than the other. So today in this lecture we're going to talk about heartworm disease, the incidence in the United States. We're going to talk about the heartworm life cycle, refresh you guys' memories. Um, I know my students um, have some difficulty remembering all of the little um, nuances of the heartworm life cycle. We're going to discuss the recommendations for diagnosis, therapy, and prevention from the American Heartworm Society. So these are very brand new guidelines that just came out in January of this year. And um, we're going to talk a little bit also about some of the strategies that shelters in the United States are using. Um, and we're going to talk about what we do specifically in our community outreach program at UF. And then I'm going to just take some time at the end to just talk about a few little cases that we've seen over the years that have been um, a little bit daunting and maybe a little bit um, confusing for me. So to get started, we're going to talk a little bit about heartworm disease. Remember that that is that heartworm is actually caused by the filarial parasite, Dirofilaria imidis. It's transmitted um, by infected mosquitoes, primarily of the genus Aedes. So this is like Aedes aegypti that spreads yellow fever and all of his other things. It's also spreading heartworm around. Um, so there's two primary vectors in the United States, but there are actually um, about 50 um, known vectors of heartworm in the United States. It's been found in all 50 states, um, but it is not known to be transmitted in Alaska. So that just means that some dogs have shown up positive, but it hasn't completed the life cycle in the mosquito in Alaska. So we know um, that uh, dogs are the definitive host, and there are also some wild canids that are, serve as reservoirs, like coyotes and, um, of course, otters, things like that. Um, Domestic wolves, if you're in that area of the country that actually are not domestic wolves, wild wolves, sorry. If you're in that area of the country that has wolves. Um, cats and ferrets are also um, considered potential um, hosts of, of heartworm, but they aren't really perfect um, um, hosts of the disease, and so they don't really have the classic signs that we see in dogs. Um, and then we do know that in shelter dogs, um, we can have a prevalence as high as 70% in endemic areas. So you can see from this map, um, remember that, that incidence is, um, this, is a, this is a prevalence map. So the prevalence is actually the number of cases in an area per 1,000 dogs. And incidence is actually the number of new cases. So this is our incidence map. And this was just released this week. I don't know if any of you guys are members of the American Heart Society. If you aren't, it's a really great um, resource for you. 
Um, and this map was just released, um, I think, on Friday. And so this just shows the number of new cases in the United States since the last map that they put out, which was in 2010. And you can see what we all know is in the south it's pretty bad because we have op um, optimal temperature, climate, and the mosquito host to spread this um, disease around. We also have a, a lot of reservoir dogs, stray dogs, um, and wild canids. So a little bit about the clinical signs. Um, so remember that it's going to depend on the severity and the duration of infection. So if you have an animal that's been, um, you know, diagnosed and maybe has had heartworm for a long time, they may have more severe clinical signs. Although I've seen dogs that have had, um, you know, maybe only a couple years old that, are have, that have cable syndrome. So it really just depends on, you know, how many worm, worms the, these animals have and the length of the time that the worms have been there. And also, it really does um, um, impact the, the disease if, if the animal exercises. So if you have an animal that's really active and they have a high worm burden, they are more likely to have more severe heartworm disease just because the pulmonary vessels are damaged every time that animal exercises. So you might find a heart murmur. I will tell you that most of the dogs that we see in our practice don't have heart murmurs. But that is um, a common finding in, in, in some practices. Um, and that's due to tricuspid insufficiency. They're, they may or may not have a gallop rhythm, so there's some electrical dis disturbances due to the heartworm. Um, you might see, if the animal's in right heart failure, you might see some jugular distension. You might see some cranial, cranial organomegaly. And they sometimes, if they're going to be in, have cable syndrome, then they're going to have some ascites fluid built up, so they're going to have this classic pot-bellied appearance. Um, remember that even dogs that don't um, have necessarily severe clinical signs can still develop a pulmonary thromboembolism. So that's when a little piece of the worm breaks off and then lodges in the lung parenchyma. And that can cause uh, hemoptysis and, and can also cause sudden death. So that's one of the reasons that we really, really stress exercise restriction in dogs that are undergoing heartworm treatment. And remember, this is really important, that the vast majority of dogs that we see um, are going to be asymptomatic. They're going to be young dogs. And I'm sure that's probably what's going on in your practices as well. And that's why uh, another reason it seems so heartbreaking to euthanize an animal simply because of a heartworm positive test, um, especially when they're not clinical and they seem so happy and healthy otherwise. So the American Heartworm Society uh, classifies heartworm disease by four different um, in four different ways. So class one is typically what we're going to see. And I'm just going to go by symptoms here. Um, we don't routinely do radiographs and blood work in our practice. So, um, you know, you would include some of these um, lab findings also if you're classifying animals that way, if you're in private practice. Um, but a class one dog would be a dog that has a positive test but is totally asymptomatic. A class two dog would have a positive heart positive heartworm tests, but maybe have mild exercise intolerance. And then a class 3 dog is going to um, also have a positive test and have moderate to severe exercise intolerance and probably a cough as well. And class 4 dogs are dogs that have cable syndrome, so that's when they have worms that are blocking um, the vena cava essentially, and they've developed ascites. And so these dogs are in, in probably in heart failure and are really um, not candidate for uh, being treated with amidocide therapy. Um, the heartworm life cycle, um, it, it does occur in two different animals. Obviously, it's going to occur in the mosquito and then also in the primary host of the dog. So the, do the mosquito will bite the infected dog, and they will ingest the microfilaria with their blood meal. So that's the L1 form of the parasite. In the mosquito, the L1 will develop to L3, and that just takes um, anywhere from 10 to 17 days. Um, and what happens is the L1 will then migrate back into the hindgut of the mosquito, which is Malpighian tubules. So just a little known fact about me, you guys, I was an entomology major in college before I went to vet school, so I know a little bit about insect anatomy. Isn't that kind of creepy? Anyway, <laughs> uh, the Malpighian tubules are, is the hindgut of the mosquito. And um, once they've developed to L3, they're going to migrate forward to the mouth parts. 
the, the mosquito is going to take a blood meal on the infected, on the dog, maybe not even infected dog. And the L3 are the infective stage of the parasite, and they're going to migrate through that puncture wound. So they're not actually injected by the mosquito. They actually migrate in the blood um, through that puncture wound and go into the tissue of the dog. So in the dog, they go through L3 all the way to L5, and L5 um, can be a juvenile adult, and it takes about 120 days for that animal then, or for that worm then to become a, a, a reproducing L5 adult. And then the cycle starts all over again. When that adult L5 starts producing microfilaria, then again, the mosquito is going to pick that up and the cycle continues. So a um, couple of key points here is that the L1 to L3 stage of that life cycle is really very temperature dependent. And so in colder areas, that's just not going to happen. And that's why a lot of people have gone to maybe just, just treating their dogs for six or eight months out of the year with heart wound prevention, and then in the wintertime, they just stop it. Um, we know from climate change that that's, you know, probably not the best um, way to do it because um, we had some really crazy weather this last winter, and we know that certainly the temperatures can be higher um, in cold areas when they're not supposed to be high. Um, so the other thing that's happened is that in large cities where you have lots of um, tall buildings, it tends to, it tends to trap heat. And so although the, the climate might be cold, in those little pockets of urban uh, development, you may have enough warmth and heat for that, for that um, uh, microfilaria to continue to develop to an L3 within the mosquito. And then the other problem that we have is a lot of these mosquitoes vectors, mosquito vectors actually overwinter as adults, so then they can resume that whole um, development. And again, like I said before, the, the de development to the L3 within the mosquito usually takes about 10 to 14, 17 days, and that's only if you have ambient temperature and the correct humidity. And so unfortunately here in the south, we tend to have that year round. Um, they have been, there's been sh uh, studies that show that uh, sampling of mosquitoes around kennel areas, around shelter areas, the infection rate can be as high as 70% in, in endemic areas. So as I mentioned before in the dog, the uh, L3 larvae enter the puncture wound that's left by the mosquito. And then in the dog, the L3 will mature to L4, which is the um, precursor to the juvenile L5. And that takes about 3 to 12 days. And both of these life cycles uh, actually travel within the muscle fibers. And so they're not really going into the vessels at this point. Um, and then L4s will become the, the L5, the young L5, about 50 to 70 days after the infection. Um, and the L5s are the ones that then penetrate through the muscle in the veins and enter the pulmonary circulation. And that is about, you know, 67 to 85 days post-infection. Then the L5s actually take a little time to mature. It takes them um, about four months post-infection before they're mature enough to mate and produce microfilaria. But the earliest that we can actually detect antigen in a heartworm-positive dog by, with the current ELISA tests that are on the market now is about five months post-infection. Um, but the microfilaria begins circulation about six months after infection. Um, and really and truly, it's probably more likely seven to nine months. So um, that's one reason we wait to test dogs, um, because we wouldn't be able to detect it otherwise. So a couple interesting facts um, that I thought was were, were kind of neat is that the adult heartworms, if left untreated, can actually live for five to seven years in the dog. And the microfilaria, which really surprised me, can live for, for one to two years. And that's without any kind of treatment. Um, and in the cat, um, the, like I said, the cat is not really a normal host for heartworm. So the adult heartworms only live for about two to three years. And you very, very rarely see circulating microfilaria in cats. Um, so how are we going to diagnose this? Well, these are the recommendations of the American Heartworm Society. Um, they recommend both an antigen test and a microfilaria test. How many of you guys are doing both? How many of you are just doing microfilaria? How many of you are doing antigen? Okay. 
And we're just doing antigen also. So um, I kind of learned something when I was going through these guidelines that maybe we need to step up and, and um, check for microfilaria too. And I'll go into why that's important. So first, a little bit about antigen tests. Remember that these antigen tests that are currently on the market uh, detect only the presence of female worms. So if you have an all-male worm uh, infection, you're, you're going to get a negative test. Okay. Um, and the other thing that's important to know is that if you have low female numbers, so you have maybe a little chihuahua that's maybe got one female worm and four, female, four male worms, um, you may not have antigenemia, so you may get a negative test. Um, because if there's uh, not enough females, obviously, to produce antigen, then you're not going to actually detect it. Um, and the other thing that's interesting, if you have a dog that's on a heartworm preventive, uh, like HeartGuard or Interceptor, one of these macrocyclic lactones, that is actually going to also suppress antigenemia. So um, if you have a dog that you're treating with flow kill um, and you've got them on these just, just this particular drug and nothing else, then you may have a negative test that's maybe not really truly negative. Um, so it's not necessary to test dogs until about seven months, and that's because the microfilaria, uh, most, of the, most of the adults are not really going to be producing um, any microfilaria or any antigen until about six months. And so um, the Heartworm Society, and this also surprised me because we always test at six months, but they said seven months is really the optimal time to test um, if you're going to, you know, test a puppy, say. Um, and then there are many tests available. You guys, I'm sure, know. Um, the IDEX SNAP test is really popular. But there's also some other, um, you know, more up-and-coming tests that are maybe less expensive and also maybe um, a little bit more sensitive and specific. So there's um, ELISA test. The ELISA test that was first developed was um, the DiraCheck test. <clears throat> and that was developed back in the, boy, like, I think it was the mid-80s um, by actually Dr. Charlie Courtney, who was at UF for many, many years. Um, and now they've got some really fancy ones, these chrom chromatographic immunoassay tests. And these are all benchtop tests. Um, and these tests are actually designed to identify most of the occult infections. And those are infections where maybe the adults are are not producing microfilaria yet. So you might ne not necessarily have a microfilaremium, but you will have a positive test because of the presence of the adult female worm. Um, and most of these tests are nearly 100% specific, and that means that if they're negative, they're really going to be negative, OK? Um, and most have a very, very high sensitivity, and that's actually the true positive rate. So that just means if they're positive, the on the test, the likelihood that they're really positive is also really high. Um, but that sensitivity on these tests are actually going to vary depending on the amount of worms the animal has in their system. And another thing that um, a lot of people do, at least I, I noticed a lot of um, vets and some of the vet techs I worked with have done, is look at the color change on the test to determine the worm burden. And you can't really do that because you may have three female worms that are making everything really bright blue. Um, and you may have, or you may have one female worm and ten male worms and it's very, very pale blue. So remember, we're only looking at female antigens. So just because it's bright blue doesn't mean there's a ton of worms there. Um, so another thing I found really interesting when I was going through the AHS guidelines is that um, you should never record an animal as being negative. I guess this is just to cover yourself, right? Because you never really know. They might have a low worm burden, right? So you should always record it as NAD or no antigen detected, OK? Because you know none of these tests are 100%. So um, one of my colleagues at the University of Florida, Dr. Maureen Long, has done a lot of work lately with heartworm and um, actually looking at the different heartworm tests. And this is some. Um, data that she presented at the American Heartworm Society meeting in January of this year. And she actually took um, five of the most commonly used uh, benchtop tests and compared them, compared their sensitivity and specificity. So she looked at the antigen rapid one step, the SNAP heartworm test by, by IDEX, um, the witness test by Zoetis, um, vet scan, which is an ABAXIS test, and then the solo step um, test by HESCA. 
and she actually compared them. Um, what you can see here, this is just the overall sensitivity. And sensitivity, remember, that's going to uh, test the true positives. Um, and you can see it's pretty high on all of them across the board. Um, so 96%, that's pretty good. So you're pretty confident when you use these tests that if you get a positive that you can almost for sure say that it truly is positive. Um, but when we looked at the sensitivity by worm burden, and this is by you know, the number of worms that the animal actually has. You can see that the favorite here, which is the SNAP test. How many of you guys use SNAP? You can see the sensitivity um, goes way down on that. And so I would just caution you just to be extra careful because you may have a dog with a low worm burden and you may, um, you may, not, you may get a negative test. This actually happened to us um, a couple of weeks ago with one of our heartworm treatments. We had a dog from the shelter that tested positive on the DiraCheck at the shelter, which is a micro well test, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and um, came in for heartworm treatment. Um, and she, the rescue group had taken the dog to their veterinarian and tested with an IDEX snap, and it was negative. So, you know, which one do you believe at that point? So I just want you guys to be aware that maybe, you know, if we have a young dog with a low worm burden, you may get a negative test. So these microwell tests were the ones that were first developed. And how many of you guys are using DiraCheck or PetCheck? Any of you in your shelters? So these, I think, are really um, a great idea for shelters because they, DiraCheck is actually considered the gold standard, although I think now with some of these newer benchtop tests, they're really sensitive and specific, so they might be performing as well as DiraCheck. Um, but DiraCheck is a well test. So you can actually do a lot of dogs at one time. I know our shelter in Alachua County, they use this test. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a 96 well plate. So theoretically, you could test 94 dogs because you have a positive control well and a negative control well. So you could do 94 dogs at once. And so that's pennies versus, um, you know, I don't know how much, 10, 10 bucks or so is, is a, a snap test goes for. Um, but, you know, the, the problem with these tests is they do require a lot of steps. So there's some technical acumen that's a little, you know, that's necessary to run these. Um, and so, you know, that might be a, a limiting factor if you don't have, if you're short staffed, or if you don't have the expertise, the person that can actually run these. The techs at our shelter have been doing them for years, and so they've got it down to a science. So, um, as I mentioned before with microfilaria testing, that the American Heart Room Society actually recommends that we test animals both with ELISA and also with a microfilaria test. Um, now, there are less than 1% of infections that are patent, and that just means that you're going to have circulating microfilaria without anagenemia. So it's a really, really low probability that you're going to have um, a negative ELISA test and a positive microfilaria test. Um, so because of this, you don't want to just test for microfilaria alone, okay, because you, you want to make sure that you, you do detect the adult worms if they're there. So why do we want to test for microfilaria? Well, it's going to validate our test results, our serologic test results that we've done. It also identifies the patient as a reservoir, a potential reservoir for infection to other dogs. And then also, if you have a very high microfilarial burden, it's going to maybe impact the way you choose to treat those microfilaria or maybe what you choose to use for heartworm prevention in that particular dog. Um, remember that certain um, heartworm preventions that we can use can actually precipitate a really severe reaction in dogs because it's going to kill those microfilaria very quickly and cause anaphylaxis. So... Um, there's a couple ways for microfilaria testing. You can take a buffy coat, um, uh, buffy coat and just look, and sometimes you can actually just see those little things wriggling around in the buffy coat. You can do a blood smear. Um, but remember, just doing a blood smear is going to be insensitive for actually detecting um, very, very low numbers of microfilaria, so it's not really going to give you an accurate count on how microfilaremic your dog is. And then it's also going to be confused with... Um, and I can't really pronounce that. I'm going to say dipetalanema because that's what I'm used to. But dipetalanema is the, is the um, non-pathogenic filarial worm of dogs that lives in the cutaneous tissues. And so this, um, 
this picture actually depicts the difference between dipelonema, which is the top worm, which is a really skinny filarial, uh, uh, microfilaria, and then di, um, diarfilaria, which is on the bottom. So the modified knots test actually allows you to differentiate those two because it's going to stain them and it's going to actually let you compare, um, you know, those, those species. So as you guys all know, it's really, really important to have all dogs, um, especially in this area of the country, on heartworm preventive. And um, the American Heartworm Society, as you guys all know, probably um, they do recommend that dogs are on year-round um, heartworm treatment, regardless of where they live in the United States. Um, puppies should actually be given their dose, first dose, um, if you're in a shelter, no later than eight weeks of age. Most of these um, heartworm preventives are labeled for six to seven weeks, so make sure as, as soon as you get a puppy that you go ahead and give them that preventive dose. So if you give a dose after eight weeks of age, so if, say you have a 15-week-old puppy and you give that dose, um, then you want to make sure that you test that dog six months after that initial dose. Because remember that dog may have been bitten by a mosquito and may have been infected before you gave him that heartworm prevention. And you want to make sure that you um, can detect that. So if it's going to be adopted, you might want to put in your, you know, um, handout to go home that you recommend that animal be tested um, six months after, you know, you gave that initial medication. And as you guys know, then, that have dogs and, and actually, you know, have your dogs on year-round prevention, it's always a good idea to check your dog every year just to make sure that that prevention is working. And uh, what's interesting is that if you reduce the reservoir population of heartworm in a community, you actually decrease the prevalence of infection in unprotected dogs. So it's sort of like you know, kids that get vaccinated for flu, in Alachua County, all of our school kids get vaccinated with intranasal flu vaccine. And it's been shown, even though the adults don't get vaccinated, the incidence of flu is actually really, really low in our county. So it's the same kind of thing. If you keep dogs on prevention and keep that reservoir population low, it's going to actually protect dogs that aren't on any pre prevention at all. So a little bit about some of the preventives. Um, macrocyclic, macrocyclic lactones are what we typically use um, for all of our prevention, and that's what's in probably every commercial preparation of heartworm preventive that we have. So the different lacto macrocyclic lactones are ivermectin, milbamycin, oxime, moxidectin, and selamectin. And you guys might remember or know these as HeartGuard, Interceptor, Advantage Multi, and selamectin as Revolution. And what's interesting is this drug actually affects all stages of the, of the heartworm life cycle. So L1 all the way up to the adults. It just affects them differently. Um, some, are, some stages are more sensitive than others to these drugs. Um, these are extremely safe drugs when used according to label directions. Um, most of these, for instance, the heart guard um, is about six micrograms per kilogram of ivermectin in one, you know, 51 to 100 pound um, cube, that's about 256 micrograms of ivermectin, so it's still a very, very low dose, so it's safe for collies and other herding breeds. Um, and then most of these also have a 30-day uh, dosing interval for both oral and topical products. So for oral administration, we have the ivermectin heart, uh, products like HeartGuard, we have Iver, IverHeart Max, and we have Milbamycin, which is Interceptor. Topically, we have the moxidectin products, which are Advantage Multi, and then Selamectin, which is Revolution. And then we also have the parental um, drug, moxidectin, which is ProHeart 6. Are any of you guys using ProHeart 6? This was a drug that was available back in the 90s and was taken off the market because some dogs had some, there were some deaths associated with it. Um, but it's been... Um, you know, re-researched and more trials have been done and it's been re-released. So this is actually um, good for six months once it's injected. It's like a depo shot um, and um, it's, it's been shown to be really effective. So a lot of shelters are just going to use um, oral ivermectin. So 1%. How many of you guys are using that for heartworm prevention? I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but just remember that it is off-label. So, and you, and you do need to be careful with it because 
the dose is so low, it's five to six micrograms per kilogram. Um, and, and so it's really just such a minuscule amount. A lot of times you have to dilute that with something just to get enough volume in your syringe. And you have to be really careful when you're dosing herding breeds with it. You don't want to, you know, you want somebody that knows what they're doing when they're figuring out these doses to go out in the kennel and give this. You don't want somebody just drawing up some indiscriminate amount of ivermectin and, and sticking it in a collie's mouth. So as I mentioned before, all stages of the heartworm are actually susceptible to these macrocyclic lactones. Um, but the L4 worm, which is the one that's hanging out in the tissue, and the juvenile worms, which are the young L5s, they have less susceptibility. And so we have this window of susceptibility here that you guys probably um, know about. And we're going to talk about strategies to try to trick the heartworm so that we can um, get the most out of our heartworm treatment by using this window. So a little bit about resistance. You guys have all heard about this, right? And how the shelter vets are to blame for this because we're all using slow kill, right? Has everybody heard this? Yeah. Well, this is actually in 2011, um, was first reported um, in veterinary parasitology by uh, the group, uh, group at Auburn. And there was a dog that was um, treated um, with adulticide therapy, it was a dog, a Katrina dog actually, um, that was treated with adulticide therapy and then after that was went through treatment um, to kill the microfilaria. And this dog went through probably about 20 different treatments and was still microfilaremic. And so they did a little bit of further testing and they discovered that that they had a resistant microfilaria on their hands and they called this the MP3 isolate. So this particular microfilaria actually has an allele on the P glycoprotein gene that actually differs from the general population of microfilaria. And it has been shown to have decreased susceptibility to monthly doses of ivermectin, milbamycin, which is interceptor, and selamectin, which is revolution. But interestingly, it is susceptible to three consecutive monthly doses of milbamycin or a single dose of moxidectin. So the single dose of moxidectin, advantage multi, is moxidectin. So if you guys are using that in your shelter, then you're probably, and you're in the endemic area where this is a problem in the Mississippi Delta, then you're probably going to be okay. Um, but it is resistant to our, you know, like heart guard and, and interceptor and just topical revolution. So what does AHS recommend for adult um, therapy if you have a heartworm positive dog. Well, they recommend, of course, that we use imidacide, which is malarsamine dihydrochloride. And, or if you have cable syndrome, they do recommend that you remove the worms. How many of you have had the guts to remove heartworms from a dog in the shelter that's in cable syndrome? You know, I was reading this and I'm thinking, I could do that. It, it doesn't seem, you know, I actually worked for Dr. Courtney for years. Um, after I graduated from undergrad, before I went to vet school. And um, Dr. Courtney was one of the gurus of heartworm. And he actually worked for a guy named Ron Jackson in, in St. Augustine um, back when he first graduated from vet school. And Ron Jackson is, is the very, very brave private practitioner that first did this surgery. So what it is, is like they don't even, you know, they, they're saying you don't even need to sedate the dog. I don't know. I think maybe sedation. But... You don't need to put them under anesthesia. In fact, you don't want to because then the worms get all, you know, harder to grab. They move, you know. Um, and so he actually, this just blows my mind, but I'm thinking I could do that. I see Kim says she could do it too. You did it? Oh. But no, so what you do is you ligate the jugular. So you do a cut down to the jugular. You ligate it um, cranial um, to where you're going to make your incision. Then you make your incision into the jugular. And you feed an alligator catheter, so it was, or alligator forcep, which is one of those long forceps with the little alligator things, down into the thoracic inlet. And then you just pull and you grab. And, and you do that until you don't get any more worms. After about three or four tries of no worms, then you stop. And then you ligate um, below where you made your incision. So they lose the jugular on that side, but they've gotten all the heartworms out. So I don't know. I mean, I think that if I were faced with that and the dog was going to die and I didn't have any other resources, I might do it. 
I mean, why not, you know, give them a shot at, at life. Um, anyway, just a little digression there, sorry. Um, so there's some adjunctive therapies also that is, are recommended by the American Heart Room Society, so steroids. And that's kind of a new thing for people in endemic areas. They're recommending the use of steroids. Um, NSAIDs and aspirin. Aspirin, not so much. NSAIDs for pain at the injection site. Doxycycline, and we're going to talk a little bit more about doxycycline and equivalent drugs um, later on. And then macrocyclic lactones, and then the combination of macrocyclic lactones with doxycycline, which is actually a really, really um, great combo. So first about imidacide. So remember from your vet school that imidacide is an arsenic compound, um, and it's only delivered by deep IM injection, and it's preferred. Actually, it's only really recommended to be given between L3 and L5 in the apaxial muscles. If you give it elsewhere and you have a problem, Mariel's probably not going to help you out. But if you um, give it in this area and you give it correctly and you have an issue, then they may um, be willing to help out with, you know, post-treatment if there's a problem. So Caparsolate was what we used when I was in vet school. I think in the mid-90s is when um, the Medicide came out. But Caparsolate was nasty. If you guys, you older vets out there, remember that. Um, you had to give that IV. And uh, I, th I remember reading at the time that actually the mortality rate was a lot higher than actually the morbidity rate when you use that. And it doesn't surprise me because you're given arsenic IV. So um, thank goodness now we have something that's um, a little safer. So uh, this drug is only going to kill the adult worms. It doesn't have any effect on worms, any of the worm um, stages under four months. And you can use a two injection protocol, which is one injection 24 hours apart, or two injections 24 hours apart, or a three injection, which is one injection, you wait a month, and then give two more 24 hours apart. The, of course, the AHS recommends that you use a three-dose protocol for all positive dogs because it results in a, a little bit more gradual kill of the worms, so they don't all die at once and, and potentially have uh, create a, a big reaction and uh, pulmonary thromboembolism. So remember, these arsenic compounds are um, they're arsenic, so they don't have a very um, uh, great margin of safety. Uh, in dogs, the dose is two and a half milligrams per kilogram, but the LD50 in dogs, so this is what kills dogs, is seven and a half mg per kg. So if you're doing multiple treatments at once, make sure that your technician labels the correct dose. You don't want to overdose a dog because you accidentally grabbed the wrong syringe if you're treating, you know, five or six dogs. And that's what we do sometimes. We have to be really careful because you know, we have all these students in there and they're grabbing syringes. And so what's one of the big things that I'm a real stickler about is making sure everything's labeled. Everybody double checks, reads the dose before they actually inject it because we don't want to inadvertently give the wrong dose. So um, it is one of the only two black label drugs in veterinary medicine. And black label is like <clears throat> the 2010 uh, equivalent of like skull and crossbones. So back in, you know, 1700s, we used skull and crossbones. Now we use black label. Now it's not the only black label drug that we use in veterinary medicine because certainly we use chemotherapeutic agents to treat cancer. And those are all black label um, but these are the there are only two that are actually labeled for veterinary medicine that are black label. One is imidacide, and does anybody know the other one? Medicam, yeah. So meloxicam, it came out with a new label last year um, because of the potential to cause kidney failure in cats. So um, the complications um, that you can see with this drug, and probably by far the most common, is pain and swelling at the injection site. You can also have ataxia and paresis or even paralysis of the pelvic limbs. This is a CT of a dog that got um, an injection. And I don't know if you guys can tell, but um, the spinal cord has shifted over a little bit. This dog developed some severe neurologic problems following um, treatment with imidacide. And I've actually um, not had, fortunately, not had anything like this, but I did have one of my rescue groups whose, whose own personal dog, the director of the rescue, her own personal dog was treated and um, developed a huge swelling at the injection site about the size of a, a softball. This was a golden retriever. And um, 
the injection was very, very close to the spinal cord, and the dog developed an ascending paralysis actually over about a week and got to the point where the dog couldn't walk or move at all, and the dog had to be carried outside in the bladder express, and they were just about to euthanize her, and it started to resolve. So when I talked to Marielle about this, because I was, you know, oh, my God, I can't believe, you know, this, this happened, and they didn't seem surprised at all. They just said they were actually surprised that the dog survived. So um, just be really careful when you inject it. I'm very, very much a stickler with our students about injecting with a doctor watching and making sure that they're far enough away from the spinal cord and some of those spinal nerves that come off. You'll know if you hit those spinal nerves, and some of you probably have, those dogs will scream because, you know, the minute the needle hits, they'll scream. And then you move it up maybe, you know, a, a half a centimeter, and they're fine. So um, if they do scream and start, you know, moving, um, don't inject it because that's when you get those big, giant, um, hard knots that form. So um, later after the treatment, things that can happen, um, fever, lethargy, and appetence. This usually is 24 to 48 hours after the initial injection. Um, for this reason, sometimes we'll send dogs home with some NSAIDs just to make them feel more comfortable. Um, they might develop a cough. As some of those worms die and the pieces break off, they could develop a pulmonary thromboembolism. And then the worst case scenario is sudden death. And that's usually if, you know, it, it can happen certainly um, when animals are exercising, but I've heard of it happening in dogs are just sitting in a crate. So, um, you know, that's something to warn people about, especially if your dogs are going out to foster um, make sure that they understand the importance of restricting exercise. And even if you do restrict exercise, you, may, you still may have something bad happen. So this is a, a little bit hard to read, but this is um, just um, a summary of some of the adverse reactions that were seen in clinical field trials. You can see that the injection site reactions, coughing and gagging, and then inappetence and anorexia were probably the highest or the most reported um, um, clinical outcomes of, of treating these, and, and then some of the others are, are much less. Um, so this is, again, um, looking at the injection site reaction and, and what you're seeing, whether it's swelling or a seroma or some of these hard knots that form or tenderness and um, stiffness um, of, the, of the limb. All right, this is Riley. If you want to run that. This was a dog that we treated... Um, a couple, about, about a month ago, and he, um, the student treated him without a doctor there, which they got yelled at. I cut that part of the tape out, sorry. <laughs> um, but this was less than 10 minutes after he was treated, and he was treated on the right side, so. You see how he's kind of dragging his foot there? This actually got worse, but I was yelling at the students. I didn't figure you guys want to hear that, so. Um, but he actually had some CP deficits. Like, he was just totally dragging his foot. And um, the injection site was about, I don't know, maybe maybe uh, 30 millimeters away from his, his dorsal spinous process. So I just want to reiterate, he, he actually did fine. We gave him some pain meds. We gave him some tramadol, and he did okay. But, you know, I just, this could have gone the other way. So just be really careful when you're injecting to make sure that you're far enough away. Um, because it is really, it's a painful injection. So the worst case scenario, of course, is if you treat a dog and they go off to foster and then um, they, the foster let them run and play. I actually really tried to find, I had this great video of a dog that we treated and he went off to, um, he was actually in a kennel situation and um, they, the rescue happily posted on Facebook, how great he was doing three days after his heart, room, his last heart room treatment, and he's running and chasing a stick, and, and you can see like the shave spots, and I just about died, and I just, I called the rescue, and I'm like, you guys, seriously, you have to keep this dog quiet, and you know, that's another thing you've got to be really careful of, make sure your, your fosters understand, make sure your clients understand, this is super important, because you don't want 
to go to all that time and effort and then have that dog die um, just because it's exercising and having the fun. And this is really, really hard to do. Don't get me wrong. I know uh, a lot of dogs we treat are really, really happy, young pit bulls, and they want nothing to do. They just want to play and have fun. And it's so hard for some of these fosters to keep them quiet, but it's so, so important. So some of the new therapies that are being advocated by the American Heart Society are the use of steroids. And I, we personally don't use steroids in our practice. How many of you guys are using steroids routinely? Um, this is um, particularly important, I guess, for dogs in endemic areas. And the thought is, is that the dogs are going to have a higher worm burden, potentially and that the steroids, a tapering dose of steroids prior to treatment is going to reduce some of that inflammatory response that you might see when those worms die. So again, it's, um, it's, it's actually used to control some of the signs of pulmonary embolism. So if pieces of worm break off, um, and then you're given it in a diminished dose, so it's a tapering dose, and again, highly recommended in endemic areas. NSAIDs, now aspirin is actually not recommended because uh, a lot of people use it because it's um, anti-thrombitic uh, effects, but it actually is contraindicated. But you can use um, NSAIDs like Prevacox and Rimadyl if you have a really painful dog after injection. Um, that's, that's perfectly fine. And I, you know, we do use these, and we use them just very um, sparingly. We just, you know, give them that day, and maybe, you know, if they call and say the dog's really painful, we may add in, you know, give them a, another day or two, but we don't give it long term. So doxycycline. Now, this is super important. Uh, you guys using doxy or its equivalent? I know you can't find doxy anymore. Um, so this is, um, you know, back, back in the day when I first started doing slow kill, and that was when I was at Kansas State back in the 90s, um, we had a lot of dogs that um, were working dogs um, because there was a lot of ranches around and when you told a rancher that their dog wasn't going to be able to work, um, they didn't like that. We didn't know a whole lot about, you know, what exactly was going on with heart. And we didn't know Wolbachia even existed. But we used to put dogs on, on heart guard and um, just monthly, which we, we now know is probably not the greatest. And I'll go into that in a minute. But doxycycline actually um, kills the obligate intracellular parasite or bacteria called Wolbachia that lives symbiotically with the all stages of the heartworm, with L, L3 and L4. And so it, it, because it's killing the bacteria, it also kills L3 and L4 because they live in a symbiotic relationship. So it also, um, if you have a dog that has an adult infection, so if there are adult worms present, it actually will suppress microfilaremia, so it actually kind of... Um, reduces their um, ability to produce offspring. Um, and um, they actually showed that dogs that, um, or microfilaria from dogs that were treated with doxycycline were not actually able to develop to an adult worm. So they might have looked normal as L3s, but they never progressed and became adults. So the recommended dose for doxycycline is 10 megs per keg twice a day for four weeks, and it's uh, suggested that that be done before you start your adulticide therapy. So we talked a little bit before about the susceptibility gap, and I want to just um, reiterate that a little bit. Um, if you have a dog that's asymptomatic and you have the space and maybe a foster home that can watch this dog, it's really a great idea before you treat with adulticide therapy to um, to just put them on the doxycycline regimen and also macrocyclic lactone, like HeartGuard or Interceptor, um, before you do the adulticide therapy. And the reason is, is it's going to give these, these worms, these L4, early L5s that are not susceptible or very, very low susceptibility to some of these drugs, it's going to give those worms time to develop to adults. We know that the macrocyclic lactones and the doxycycline together are going to kill the L3s. And, we're, and it's going to suppress the um, reproduction in the adults. But we have that window, L4 to L5. So if you let these go for two to three months, then these L3 or these L4, L5, immature L5s are going to then become adults, and you're not going to have any more L4s. So when you do your adulticide treatment, you're going to be killing all adults. You won't have any L4s left. 
So if you can do it, this is always recommended because you're going to have probably about, if you use the three dose protocol, you're going to have a 98 to 99 percent kill rate of your adult heartworm. Versus if you use, if you don't do this, you're going to have about a 90 percent. So it, it does three things. It reduces the new infection. So obviously if the, if the dog is bitten by an infected mosquito, you're giving it a macrocyclic lactone, it's going to take care of that. It's going to uh, kill the uh, susceptible larvae. Um, and it's going to allow those older worms then to mature um, so that they're going to be more susceptible then to the adulticide therapy. So this um, combination, how many of you guys are using this for slow kill? Anybody? Okay, so uh, the macrocyclic lactone like HeartGuard and doxycycline together, these actually together suppress the production of um, adult or microfilaria by the adult worm, and they also weaken the adult heartworm. And then they also, um, in combination, actually uh, provide more rapid adulticidal therapy, so it's going to kill the adulticide faster than if you're just using the macrocyclic lactone alone. Um, and again, you're going to get rid of the Wolbachia for the reasons I talked about before. Um, and you can use this method in cases where you have a shortage of, of emeticide, which we are probably going to have here again pretty soon. And also when you have um, cases where maybe treating is contraindicated. So you want to go doxycycline, again, 10 megs per keg, twice a day for four weeks, and then concurrently keep them on monthly heartworm prevention. So this combination, again, just to reiterate, is more, has more rapid adulticidal therapy than just ivermectin. So those of you that are using ivermectin as a slow kill, I would suggest that you somehow combine with doxycycline or its equivalent, and you're going to get a better outcome. Oops, sorry about that. So there was a study in 2011 um, of, it was only 11 dogs, but they actually um, showed that dogs that received um, macrocyclic lactone with Pyrantel, which was probably either um, Iverheart or um, HeartGuard, they were given it every 15 days rather than every month, but they gave doxycycline at 10 megs per kg um, twice a day for a month, um, but they actually killed 100% of the worms at day 300. So this will kill the adults a lot faster than just um, the macrocyclic lactone alone. And remember the life cycle of the adult without being treated is five to seven years. So if you look at the AHS guidelines, they actually define slow kill treatment as the use of only the macrocyclic lactone in heartworm positive dogs. Um, and Remember that the, the, by using these drugs, we're going to reduce the lifespan of the juvenile and the adults, and then the older worms are going to be less susceptible, and they're going to take longer to die. Um, and remember that one of the big issues about heartworm disease is even though you're, you know, you're treating monthly with heart guard, those worms are still there, and they're still causing damage in the pulmonary vessels, and they're, you know, the more the dog exercises, the more severe that damage is going to be. Um, and so... If you're treating that way, remember, it might take up to a year, according to this study, but that, the former study, but that was also with doxycycline. So back in the day when I used to treat these dogs, it would take at least two years for the worms to clear with just using um, ivermectin products alone. And are you going to restrict a dog's exercise for two years? Because really, that's what you would have to do. And that's going to be a really, really tough sell, like for a new adopter. Um, to say, well, you can't take your dog to the dog park for two years until we have, have a negative heartworm test. Um, and the other problem with this is, is this is the reason why the American Heartworm Society thinks that we're developing resistance because we're using just these alone without um, adding doxycycline or its equivalent in. <clears throat> so what do we do after um, the dog's gone through heartworm therapy? Um, we should re perform antigen testing six months after the treatment. And um, for dogs that have been treated immediately after their diagnosis and they weren't given heart and preventative until the, the time of diagnosis or after the adulticide therapy, you want to make sure that you test those dogs about seven months after the initial dose of heartworm prevention. 
Um, and you again, according to Heartworm Society, you want to test for microfilaria as well as for antigen. So how do we get rid of, rid of the microfilaria? I will say in our practice, we leave that up to the rescue groups. Um, fortunately, most of our dogs are on doxycycline or its equivalent. And um, it's been shown that by using uh, these together with microcyclic it actually eliminates the need for doing the microfilaricidal uh, therapy post-treatment. Um, but if you don't use doxycycline, then you're going to want to treat the dogs about three to four weeks after the adulticide therapy. Um, and there's a, a, a few things that you can use. Um, but remember that it might take a while to eliminate those, so you just need to retest them. So it's not like you're going to kill them all with one, you know, the first time. Um, remember that Katrina dog, it went through about 10 or 12 um, weekly treatments and still didn't clear those microfilaria. So, um, but this is very important to do if you're, we're talking about eliminate, eliminating reservoir hosts. So, you know, even, the dog, even though the dog is going to be negative, he's still got circulating microfilaria that's potentially infecting, you know, other dogs in the community. So some of the things that we can use um, to kill the microfilaria post-treatment is Interceptor, and that used to be the um, FDA-approved uh, labeled drug to um, kill microfilaria, and that's just at the labeled dose. So whatever the dog weighs, you just give it a, a dose of the milbamycin, and that's going to um, kill the microfilaria. Um, it's really important, too, if you're going to do this, to make sure that you um, maybe keep the dog in your practice or your shelter for the day to look for signs of anaphylaxis because that could potentially happen still, especially if they're very highly microfilaremic. Um, you can also give ivermectin at 50 uh, micrograms per kilogram, so that's about 10 times the dose of what you would get in a heart guard. Um, and that's, again, um, the microfilaricidal dose. Be careful in collies. I know the dose is a little higher in collies, but you want to make sure your dose is accurate. Um, and, and then what's interesting to me, and, and this is actually the, the FDA-approved um, microfilaricidal drug now is Advantage Multi or Moxidectin because Moxidectin at the labeled dose actually has, they've never seen an adverse reaction and it, again it's the only FDA-approved. So if you guys are using that then that's great, kudos um, because that's going to take care of the microfilaria without um, having that anaphylaxis that we see with the other drugs. So you guys probably know this has been a hot topic lately on how we treat shelter dogs. Um, certainly um, there's a lot of things to consider if you're treating a dog in a shelter. There's certainly financial considerations. It's not cheap to, to treat dogs for heartworm disease. Certainly the length of stay becomes a welfare issue if the dog has got to stay there a long time to be treated. You know, you ideally would want to get them out to foster care, but then you have to trust your foster to make sure they're going to confine them and, and and keep them, you know, from running and being crazy. And then you have to decide who you're going to treat. Um, so Dr. Pollock and Dr. Blackmore, uh, Smith Blackmore at um, Animal Rescue League of Boston recently uh, wrote this paper, just an overview of, of how to do that. And I will say the American Heart Society is sensitive to this and, and they are working on developing um, some recommendations for shelters and what, what you should do um, with your heartworm positive dog. So there have been a few um, studies that have looked at um, how shelters are treating dogs. Um, this study was done in 2011 and this surveyed about almost 1,500 animal shelters across the United States. Um, of those surveyed, um, only about 30 percent even tested their dogs for heartworm infection. These were shelters, I, I want to point out, that are in the deep south. So a lot of these shelters are very, very resource scarce. So we're talking Alabama, Florida, Georgia, and Mississippi. So these are areas where we know heartworm is endemic, um, but yet only 30% of these shelters had the resources to even test the dogs for heartworm. Of the ones that um, they tested, um, 39% treated every infected dog. And I would imagine that probably... Um, these, this 39% were probably humane societies, the people that had other resources, because I know um, the open admission shelters, at least in our area, around Alachua County, the resources are pretty sl uh, slim. And so um, 
they're not going to necessarily be able to treat all the dogs or any of the dogs. So 49% of those shelters treated only some of the infected dogs, and again, that probably had to do with adoptability, and then 12% didn't treat any dogs. So again, what they were looking at uh, the protocols that were used, and of those 443 shelters that did treat in the Deep South, 43% uh, of those used a two-dose injection of malarcinine, 35% used a three-dose injection, and 22% used long-term low-dose ivermectin, and that's slow kill and without doxycycline, I assume. So um, recently, Dr. Brian DeGangi, um, who is a colleague of mine at UF, um, sent out a survey to the shelter vet listserv, and some of you guys might have answered this. Um, there was actually 104 shelter veterinarians that responded to this survey. We were just trying to look at what shelter vets across the whole United States were, were doing for heartworm positive dogs. And I will say that, you know, certainly uh, shelters that probably have more resources or veterinarians with more resources were probably more likely to answer this. Um, survey than those that didn't, um, because actually some of the results kind of surprised me. Um, so we had 104 shelter veterinarians that responded to the survey, and 42% of the shelters that we surveyed um, tested all dogs, um, 40, about 49% uh, tested some of the dogs, and about 10% didn't test any dogs at all. And that might be, again, they might have been in an area that's not endemic. And for heartworm prevention, the majority of the respondents to this um, listserv survey um, indicated that they used oral ivermectin, so just, you know, out of the bottle. Um, uh, oh, sorry, that's, that's actually a, a prevention that's actually labeled for use. And then 20% used off-label ivermectin. So that was surprising to me, too, because um, I guess with a, a lot of shelters are not able to afford, you know, some of the topical or the oral treatments. And most of the uh, veterinarians indicated that they had, um, that at least some of their heartworm dogs were treated. Um, and most of them made their decisions based on whether the dog had behavioral problems, other behavioral problems, or maybe other medical problems that would not make them adoptable. Interestingly, um, most of the vets that responded um, used a three-dose protocol, which I, I kind of found surprising because that's going to be more expensive. Um, and a lot of these shelters reserved the three-dose protocol for dogs under 25 pounds, and that might be, and you'll see when I talk about it at the end, maybe some of these smaller dogs tend to have more reactions than maybe some of the big ones. Um, only 7% of the shelters just use ivermectin alone without doxycycline, and this other category indicated that they use doxycycline with monthly ivermectin, which is actually uh, very good. So some are using adjunctive therapy. 80% um, of the shelters use doxy or its equivalent, as well as the macrocyclic lactone. And other treatments that they um, used included um, nonsteroidals and tramadol. Um, some used Benadryl um, prior to treatment to hold, uh, you know, to fend off a reaction. And then some were using dexamethasone. And by the way, dexamethasone is not recommended. Um, prednisone is, but dexamethasone actually will affect the um, ability of the malarcinine to kill the worm. So prednisone is recommended, dexamethasone is not. So what do we do with elective surgeries? This is actually one of my students who got a surprise. Uh, we knew the dog was heartworm positive, but when she opened her up, this is, she's holding onto the uterus, this is what popped out. Um, we actually advocate for going ahead and doing those elective surgeries. How many of you are doing elective surgeries prior to treatment. If the dog is asymptomatic, it's probably a safer way to go because as, as my anesthesiologist, Dr. Pablo, you guys talked to him, I think he talked to you guys yesterday, um, he says, you know, it's better to, to, to anesthetize an, a healthy worm than a non-healthy worm. So if the worm has been treated already, he's not going to be that healthy and he might break off into pieces and cause an embolism during anesthesia. So it's always better to keep the worms healthy until you um, until you spay them and then you can do the treatment. We typically wait at least a week before we um, start with our adulticide therapy after surgery, but we always um, spay and neuter first. So now what do we do with these shortages? Um, 
So in 2011, um, this, this letter on the right is from the American Heart Room Society alerting um, all veterinarians to the shortage of a medicide. Um, and that was, you know, we thought that was going to be horrible. And actually, it wasn't too bad. Um, we, we went for a few months without it, but then they were able to ramp up production in, in Europe, and we were able to get it. And what's really nice about Marielle is they do tend to, um, they're more willing to give it to shelters um, than they used to be. And I think they're recognizing, they want, they want to first, I think, get rid of this um, resistance thing. They want, they want to encourage shelters to, to treat dogs rather than um, just do the slow kill. Um, and I, we've not really had any difficulty getting this. Have any of you guys had trouble getting it, Malarsmine? Um, well, this other letter here, this Marielle letter from November, this, this is telling us that there's going to be a new shortage. So I'm just you know, holding my breath and hoping that um, we're going to still be able to get it. And, um, you know, this is, I think, going to be the, our life for a while with wow. not just these drugs, but a lot of veterinary drugs. So the American Heart Society then came up with a new treatment plan that endorsed a slow kill. Now, it's important to, to note that this is slow kill using doxycycline and not just macro, macrocyclic lactones alone. So... Um, what they recommend in um, cases where you have a shortage of amidocyte is you want to go ahead and start your heartworm preventive therapy. You want to start your doxycycline therapy. Again, the same dose, 10 mg per kg, twice a day for four weeks. And then you want to repeat this doxycycline once every three months. So one month out of every three, you're going to repeat that doxycycline until you have uh, the availability of malarsamine. You want to make sure that you restrict all exercise. Again, um, that's really important in not making the disease worse. And um, you just want to treat the symptomatic dogs palliatively. If you have a dog with cable syndrome, get the guts and pull those worms out. And then you want to make sure to retest before you um, administer the adulticide because, you know, if you went a long enough time, you may have cleared the infection. So now we have more shortages, doxycycline. Used to be free at Publix, breaks my heart. I used to just, you know, we used to dispense it like candy to all of our heartworm positive dogs, and now we can't get it anymore. Um, I think I, I looked on the Publix website, and I think it's like $300 for, for 60 days. I don't know, it's crazy. Um, but now the FDA says the shortage has been resolved. But if you read the frying pen, it says no supply results uh, or no no supply issue anticipated so they don't even they know it's resolved but they don't know when we're going to be able to get it again so the bottom line is there's probably one factory making it and they don't know when they're going to have enough to distribute it and it's probably never going to be free again unfortunately so what do we do if we don't have doxy um, so Brian Blackburn who is at Auburn um, gave the the bottom two doses we actually use menocycline which is um, very, very similar to um, doxycycline. Um, the disadvantage that we've seen, it's the same dose as doxy. The disadvantage we've seen with this is it tends to cause a little bit more nausea and vomiting in um, our, our canine patients than maybe doxycycline. Um, it doesn't really help to give it with food. Um, if they're going to get sick from it, then, um, you know, sometimes we have to even stop the, the therapy. So you can also use azithromycin or, or rifampin. Um, those are going to probably be more expensive because they're human drugs, and um, rifampin is actually a drug they use to treat TB in people. So how much does it cost to treat a dog? Well, at UF, and I'm not sure if, if the shelter, if our pricing is going to be the same as what you guys pay for um, malarsamine through Marielle, but our cost is about $10 a mil, roughly. So we get five boxes for $486, so it's around 10 bucks a mil. So if we do a three-dose pro protocol on a 22-kilogram dog, that's going to cost us around $60, just in a medicide. Um, again, Publix used to have free doxy. Now it's $342 for 60, 100-milligram tablets, so that's not even going to last very long, especially if you're doing that alternative um, slow kill if we run out of malarsamine. Um, if we are... Menocycline is a little bit cheaper. Um, you can see roughly... Um, I don't know, it's like 16 cents a tablet or so for the 50 milligram tablet. 
And then HeartGuard, we actually get this for free. We're really lucky because we are the Marielle um, Veterinary Community Outreach Program, and so Marielle provides us HeartGuard so we can in, then pass that on to our rescue groups. But if we were to buy it, it would be, you know, $53 roughly for six months supply. Ivermectin is by far the cheaper alternative. Um, and, you know, just remember to dose it carefully. I am perfectly fine with people using ivermectin. I think it's probably really smart. Okay, so what are our problems with treating? Well, many of our shelters can't even afford to test the dogs that we've seen from some of this data and much less treat them. And if they do treat, maybe they're just going to use the slow kill, which is just the macrocyclic lactone. Again, remember that they discourage, the AHS discourages just the use of that alone. If you're going to do that, you want to make sure you use with Doxy. Um, and um, remember that development of resistance is real, and we want to make sure that we don't contribute to that. We can help it. So what are our choices then? Well, we can not treat at all, which really isn't very ethical, and also you're going to cause continuing damage to the pulmonary vessels if we don't treat. The slow kill method with just the macrocyclic lactones, again, we're going to have that resistance that we don't want, um, and also the ongoing pulmonary damage. Um, the slow kill plus doxy is going to be better, but again, you're still going to have to restrict exercise, and you're still going to have ongoing damage to the vasculature. The two-dose therapy is going to be much less expensive, and it might, is probably a better choice for asymptomatic dogs. And then the three-dose therapy is probably going to be the better choice for dogs that are symptomatic. But what do we do? You know, we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't, right? We're going to cause resistance if we use slow kill, and we're, we don't have enough money to treat all the dogs with a three-dose protocol, which is what AHS wants. So I'm going to thank Julie Levy, and she's not here, for her um, clandestine attempts at getting this information for me from NAVC. But she, um, this was a, a talk that was presented by Clark Atkins, and they actually looked at dogs at, at NC State University that um, had been treated for heartworm. It was 350 dogs, and these um, were dogs that belonged to low-income families after Hurricane Floyd in 1999, and none of these dogs had pretreatment blood work or radiographs. Any of you doing pretreatment blood work, radiographs? So we do a little bit, but not we don't do radiographs. Um, and they were using the two-dose protocol, and out of the 350 dogs, they only had two fatalities. One dog was in chronic heart failure, and one had cable syndrome. So um, that's pretty good. So when do you use the two-dose method? Well, when you have financial concerns. So if you're a shelter, this is perfect, right? Um, if you have a young and apparently healthy dog, again, that's shelter too, right? Because most of our dogs are going to be young, they're going to look healthy, they're going to be happy. Um, if we have a young dog that we know has had a short exposure, um, dogs that have already undergone adulticide therapy, if you have a treatment failure, then you don't want to do a three-treatment protocol again, just a two is going to be sufficient. And then dogs that you can restrict their exercise. So these are all um, um, good, good choices for use in two-dose. So in at NCSU, this, this uh, talk, um, this is pretty expensive. Um, their two-dose protocol is $360. Two-dose protocol, if they add doxycycline, is $415. I think this is actually at the hospital itself. They give them a cut rate, but still, this is crazy. Uh, Three-dose protocol plus doxy plus a workup is $870. You know, most shelters can't afford this. I can't afford this. I, I couldn't afford to, to pay for this in my practice. And that doesn't include the heartworm preventive. So our program, um, we actually started in 2003 as the UF Shelter Medicine Program. We had one faculty, which was me. We had zero vet techs, and we had five to seven, depending on the whim of um, the student services office, how many they wanted to assign to me, five to seven very enthusiastic veterinary students. Um, we started treating the heartworm positive dogs in Alachua County in 2004, very late 2004. And then from 2004 until now, we've treated 565 dogs. So these are just this is a pie chart of the rescue groups that we've um, worked with. Um, these um, larger pieces of the pie are Maddie's partners. Um, um, our community got a grant in 2000 um, from Maddie's fund. And so these guys are really, we work really closely with them, and we do the majority of their treatments for them. We don't do routine pretreatment blood work or radiographs. We sometimes do CBC and chemistries on older dogs, but not always. 
Um, most of our patients, again, just like uh, Heartworm Society says, are asymptomatic. This is just a copy of our treatment sheet that we use. Um, we do the three-dose protocol in most of our patients. So we actually, in, um, before 2006, we did two-dose protocol. The reason we do three-dose, quite honestly, is because we're at a university and we have all these students and we want, um, we kind of want a lot of things that we do mimic what goes on in our hospital. Um, because we can get the drug fairly cheaply, we, um, we just feel more comfortable using this protocol. Although I used the two-dose protocol for about two and a half years and didn't have any problems. So I think that the two-dose protocol is, is fine. We transitioned to the three-dose protocol in 2000, 2006, 2007 for all of our dogs. And we've only had one dog that tested positive following treatment and had to be retreated with the two-dose. So we recommend four weeks of minocycline. Now, we don't provide this for our rescues. Um, we will provide prescriptions for them, but we don't actually, you know, give it to them for free. Um, we also recommend that they also be on concurrent uh, macrocyclic lactone, that they, they're going to get the three-dose protocol, one injection and four weeks, and then um, four weeks later, two injections 24 hours apart. We routinely do give at least one dose of an NSAID at the time of injection. And if they need additional pain medication, like tramadol, we'll prescribe that. We do sedate very, very rarely, very rarely. We actually had to sedate a dog the other day because he was trying to bite us, but um, we usually just use ace butorphanol, um, sometimes dexdomator. But this is how we distract our dogs so we don't need to sedate them. This thing in the middle, the Easy Cheese, that is bomb. So if you guys go to Target and get a deal on Easy Cheese, dogs love this stuff, and they will, it's like crack. They will, they, will, they will let you do anything to them if they get Easy Cheese. So um, this works great. And pepperoni, too. Pepperoni slathered in Easy Cheese is great. So this is the cost for treatment for a 25-kilogram dog. So for minocycline, the rescue group um, has to pay for that. That's going to be about $50 for four weeks. So it's, it's still expensive, but not near as expensive as doxycycline. Our cost for the melarsamine for that dog would be $73. And for a two-dose protocol, it would be $48. And then HeartGuard Plus, if the rescue had to buy it, would be about $9 a dose. So if you're looking at adding everything up, for a three-dose protocol, it would be about $130. For a two-dose protocol, about $106. Now, um, we charge the rescues for a dog this big would be $85. So we don't make a lot on it. We, we lose money on it. But, um, you know, it's worth it to us to be able to save these dogs. Um, from euthanasia. So this is just a graph showing our heart and treatment. You can see in 2011 we really didn't miss a beat. So there was a shortage but we didn't really notice it. Our average age of dogs that we treated was about 3.2 years but you can see most of them are around 2. This is just estimated. Um, our complication rate very very low about 5% complication rate. Again I don't know if all of this is accurate because sometimes the rescues aren't going to report this to me. If it's just mild pain or swelling, they might not even tell me. So they're going to tell me if there's more, you know, if they need tram at all or if there's a big knot that formed. Um, we've had a 1% death rate, um, about five dogs out of the 565. Um, and we have no statistical difference in complication rate, death rate, for male versus female, two or three dose protocol, or at the age of treatment. And we've treated some older dogs also. Just real quickly, I'm going to talk about three dogs that were a little vexing for us. Um, this is Duncan. Um, he was a three-year-old Menpin, 4.3 kilogram dog, little tiny guy. He presented to us with a grade three murmur, so, and he presented for neuter. So we actually took him over to cardio. He was actually in cable syndrome. <laughs> this dog had no, I mean, he looked fine to us. He didn't have any ascites. Um, and they actually extracted 54 adult worms from him, which is the record at UFCVM. The record up to that point was 106 worms, but that was from a like a 50-pound boxer. So for weight, per weight range, this this guy beats it. And this is him, you know, proudly displaying his worms in a cup. This dog actually turned into a land shark after we pulled these worms out. He came back for a miticide, so he was actually feeling pretty bad. We thought, oh, he's just a sweet little guy, but yeah, he turned into a land shark because he felt so much better after we pulled those worms. Um, this is Bellamy, and Bellamy came in um, with a negative heartworm test using a Dyrachec from our, our local shelter. 
he did present with a neuter, uh, uh, with a heart murmur. He came in for a neuter. So our, what we normally do, because cardio is really great to us, and they'll just look at our dogs for free. So we sent him over, and they said, oh, yeah, well, the murmurs do all the heartworms he's got in his heart. And we said, well, he's negative. I'm like, no, he's not negative. And you can see, I don't know if you can see those little squiggly lines. Those are some heartworms in the heart. Um, so we retested him with IDEX snap, and he was still negative. So the conclusion we came to was this dog had, because he was a small dog, he had an all-male infection, which is probably pretty rare, um, but it does happen. So just make sure that you're aware of that. And then finally, we had Tiger. Tiger was a three-year-old little chihuahua, little tiny guy. Again, all of these dogs are little. This is a theme here. This is maybe why we want to do a two, uh, three dose on these. Um, he actually had the three dose protocol in February and March of 2009, was adopted by a really, really very um, conscientious owner, was kept on heart and prevention, retested uh, six months following the treatment, which is what was recommended, and he was still very strong positive. So we actually retreated him with a two-dose protocol. So this can happen. Um, you know, just be aware of that. This is the only one that I'm aware of that we've had to retreat. So um, just to conclude, um, remember that your treatment plans are going to vary uh, among different shelters depending on your resources. And if you don't have the funding for three-dose, by all means, do a two-dose. That's, that's going to be a, a great outcome most of the time. And if you have are faced with a melarsamine shortage like we probably are going to be faced with here in the next month or so, then make sure that you add your doxycycline or equivalent drug into your macrocyclic lactone um, therapy. Um, remember not to use those alone because that's going to um, induce resistance and also it's going to increase your length of treatment. And remember to exercise restrict all dogs undergoing heart room treatment regardless of, of the method that you're using. Here's my references, and I just wanted to prove that we do more than pit bull heartworm treatments at ACAS. This is Elvis. He was treated about a month ago. Thanks. I'll take any questions.